And can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, I apologize firstly, because this deck is pretty much um, shared from conference to conference at the moment. I haven't really had time to update it, um, but I'll um, try and extrapolate the, the specific K-native elements as I go through. Um, so I'm not boring you with too many um, superfluous components. Um, so I've called this taking AI to the edge because um, predominantly it's focusing on um, how I've moved some of the machine learning components um, in this solution I'll cover um, onto edge devices. Um, but a lot of the pipeline is both cloud and edge based. So I want to cover how those two things differ um, in this particular solution. And this is an 11 year old project um, or almost 11 years um, this year. Um, and originally was uh, started as a hobby project and is now a, a large commercial project. So I'll cover some of that evolution as I, I go through as well. But this means that a lot of the components are not um, consistent throughout this solution. Um, but I'll try and um, talk about some of the um, difficulties of how that um, technology roadmap has evolved as, as we've gone through as well. But when it comes to things like K-native, those elements are, are fairly new in comparison to other elements. So that they're, they're not um, used throughout this solution. Um, so um, I've said adding ML um, to coffee here because it's actually a agricultural project um, specifically focused on um, the coffee industry. So the case that I, I had originally was um, to build a sustainable agricultural product. And again, as a hobby project before it kind of got out of hand. Um, so it focused on um, urban farming and um, rural farming predominantly in Kenya originally, but now across um, Africa and South America. Um, and around 60,000 farms, I think, run on, run on the platform. Um, it focuses on coffee production only, but that was meant as a case study. It's actually the components now run on forestry solutions as well to do sustainable forestries um, and other food areas as well, but not predominantly with the, the same core components. So the idea is to track coffee production from um, the origin all the way through to the cup and make sure that it's sustainable throughout and make sure that it's both sustainable ecologically and economically. So covering both of those elements. So that means understanding the market data and understanding the, um, the environmental data as well. So using predictions from weather systems and um, commodity markets and trading markets and to advise the farm producers and the retailers on what they need to do to make it more sustainable. Um, so the challenges were low cost delivery. I didn't want to pass on any costs to farmers. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that I could afford to build it in the first place. Um, low connectivity services. So we had um, 2G and below. Um, it, sometimes it was just simply 1G um, to get the connectivity. So we were using SMS data essentially to send data up from the farms. Um, so those pipelines had to be efficient. Um, I say a small team on the next point, but essentially it was just me um, for at least five or six years. Uh, and then it was uh, multiple complementary teams that helped me get there from different companies. Um, and then multi-region. So again, I've, I've said before, it goes across borders, uh, across Africa and South America and, and Europe. Um, and then uh, I've used the term self-sovereignty here. So for, for those that aren't aware of the term, it's just essentially giving everybody the ownership of their data here. So that was quite a technical um, obstacle to actually getting this rolled out because we wanted to make sure that um, the data wasn't centralized and none of the actual software was centralized. So the way we rolled out software had to mean that people could own that pipeline themselves as well. So, um, starting off with um, the farm, we had the original mist. Um, and when, when I talk about mist, I mean the sensors, and we also had um, automated machinery and drones. Um, we rolled out custom software um, to those devices, and we had different partners at different stages. So um, I think in 2015 or 2016, uh, NVIDIA helped out with some drones, otherwise we couldn't have done that. Um, and we did the machine learning on, on board the drones, so we didn't have to um, take that data afterwards and um, so it was fully automated and then we had sensors picking up things like uh, moisture um, lighting uh, and different different weather effects like wind as well just to see what the effect would be on the crops and with the drones we did um, spectrographic analysis um, so we could scan the crops by um, 
um, flying drones over and then taking imagery and then working out what looked healthy and what didn't. And that's what we're using in the forestry solutions now, um, in large forestry solutions in Canada and um, the Nordics. Um, so we scan the forests um, and then read the data and figure out how healthy the forests actually are. Um, so that's the mist. The fog is the components that aggregate in different regions. So typically one farm could span quite quite a large landmass and then it had multiple mists and then the fog would aggregate that data. So we didn't needlessly send data to, to the cloud. So we had quite a few different gateways. We had control management systems there so you could manage the system with your um, uh, SMS messages. Um, data processing, um, we had ETL for data transformations locally so we didn't send uh, superfluous data up um, and then we had machine learning inference locally so we could figure out how to operate the machinery but also how to advise the, the producers on the ground what to do in case uh, we were predicting um, bad weather effects or we're predicting s significant market changes. And a lot of these components are, are fairly off-the-shelf components but we worked with ARM and IBM to provision a lot of the hardware um, to make it easier. So this is holistically what a single farm would look like um, at a very simple high level. We have the uh, neural processing units. So NVIDIA provided us with a lot of hardware for that. Um, Anticipated control to actually control the devices using SMS. Um, we used Apache Kafka to do aggregation of the data and Spark do the ETL or ELT. Um, and we used uh, uh, low on gateways across different um, farms to aggregate that data from the different devices, including landing areas for the drones. So the fog management was Pelion. It was originally owned by Arm, but Pelion did, um, because it had to be um, multi-cloud for the farms, because there's a self-sovereignty issue, um, Pelion was used to do the device management rather than using something like Azure IoT Hub or um, AWS's IoT management software. Um, used custom Yocto builds for the implementations and then K3S orchestration over the top of that on the fog platforms. And the um, MIST platforms had lower level software, but the FOB platforms used K3S um, orchestration, both from the cloud through to the edge devices. Um, and that was provisioned um, predominantly manually in the beginning and then using Pelion and then eventually using an automated pipeline, which I'll cover in a, in a moment. Um, and then on each FOG, we had a custom low level update manager that was written in Rust as well, just to um, ensure that we could replace the orchestration layer if need be. Um, and we worked with ARM on that software. So I'm going to focus on the data platform. There's a lot of other components within this solution. There's uh, mobile apps, web apps, um, different in interface and integration components as well, but that would take far too long to go over. Um, and I don't think I could keep everyone's attention for that long. So I'll focus on the data platform for now. Um, and that's where the pipelines are the most interesting, I think. Um, so for the ingest, uh, used Kafka for data streaming, um, used Flink for the aggregation, uh, Spark for the processing and then Hadoop over HDFS and Lustre for storage. So that was high performance storage of data. Each ingest area for the cloud, um, because there was multiple ingests, would be handling around 320 terabytes of data a month on average. So we had to ensure that the uh, file system itself was high performance in, in that solution. Um, and then a data lake I built, um, again, it had to be cross-platform, a, a lot of cloud providers provide their own, um, but this was a generic um, portable one that anybody else could own if they wanted to reload this solution up and, and manage it on their own farm. So it's st fairly standard components um, and fairly relevant to, to the conversation, but I'll just go over quickly that um, we used Airflow for the uh, orchestration of the pipeline for the data. Uh, Apache Atlas for governance, uh, Spark for the ETL, um, and Apache Ranger for security. And then there was uh, Amundsen's data catalog um, for actually listing the data and allowing it to be queryable by other sources. So the data lake was singular and, and central um, physically, but um, conceptually it could be managed by multiple teams with their own governance and, and their own security protocols. And this is, uh, has been reused on multiple solutions since I built this for, for this project. It's kind of the same components. Um, and again, uh, solutions like the Forestry solution, and we're using a lot of these components in medical solutions as well. So um, uh, like medical equipment where we can sense what's happening with a certain piece of medical equipment in the hospital. It goes through the same pipeline as this and, and same, same analysis layer as well. 
Um, and then um, separated the data lake into a data mesh. So what I mean by that is technically it's very similar, but we separated the teams into multidisciplinary teams. So the data scientists were not separated into their own um, own containers. They, they worked with the development teams uh, into functional product teams instead. So they would develop with the development teams on an end-to-end -end solution for every data ingest that came in. So every source, like for example, lighting data or moisture data, that would be a product and would build a, a service based on that. So we'd build a batch service and a standard REST or GraphQL web service as well based on that. So it would be managed by the same same group of people. And, and that allowed a, a different focus and set of priorities depending on who I was working with in, in scaling this solution up. Uh, and then each product is served to the lake and it's also can be served to third party components as well, like mobile apps or, or web apps. Um, and then the governance is distributed. So as I mentioned previously, we use Apache Atlas for distributed governance, um, but the data could be centralized. So it's physically how it works is different from how the teams operate. The teams are decentralized, but the storage can be centralized. Um, so the policies were managed centrally as well. And it was important to manage those policies um, in a ubiquitous way because the complexity of this um, is, is quite high. And then this is specific um, to the um, mapping solutions. We had to do a lot of augmenting of the data indexing. Again, it's irrelevant to the K-native, but it's it's worth going over that there was a lot of custom um, mapping solutions that were worked on to, to get the indexing and performance up on managing that much data. Um, so the business intelligence was the um, bit that made most organizations interested in this solution. So that was all about providing um, pretty graphs and reporting. So there's a lot of different components in there that made that happen. Um, a lot of the companies we worked with were using things like um, Power BI, um, which is quite ubiquitous in a lot of organizations. Uh, we needed something that could roll, roll out in each organization depend, um, independent of what kind of cloud provider they were with or what hardware they were using. So. Again, Kafka and Spark were there. We used um, Dewey for the time series and um, real-time data um, and Killing for historical data. And m most of these are Apache projects um, and they, they're quite um, proven in this kind of space. So it's been very easy to get them to roll out. Um, but the rollout originally was very manual to get all of this to work. Um, and then Redash used for the actual dashboard and Superset as well for, for the real-time dashboards. Uh, added a few ex extra things at the end of what I started adding last year to this solution, which is Pino for new data. It was still reviewing that. And then Presto for data querying. So that's the Facebook aggregation for data querying. And then the data science element. So this is where the research happens. So a lot of this is hypothesis driven development. A lot of the machine learning to do the predictive intelligence is based on um, ideas and concepts that aren't proven. So we need the data scientists to be able to look at that data in a safe way without um, any of the data getting leaked. Um, so we create a secure data science pocket that comes through the same data lake and then they can experiment with that data without actually um, having access to that data. So they go through the same catalog, but there's a set of policies in the governance to prevent them doing anything else with the data. Um, and then once they've done a model or report, then they can put that into a pipeline and then ship it to either the BI tool if it's a report, or they can ship it to the edge network or the cloud um, intelligence services if they want to actually render that model um, in a solution somewhere. And that is automated as well. So the actual um, pipeline deployments are. So this is where it actually gets interesting, where we start looking at the, those pipelines of how everything gets built and deployed. So one of the things I did differently to most client projects I work on, um, typically they use something like Terraform. I, I don't, if I can get away with it. So I didn't on this project. I had free range to do whatever I want, wanted. So um, I created a custom cloud bootloader and this bootloader um, would load up any cloud provider um, that was supported on this. So we, we did the big, uh, three, and um, we also supported uh, Red Hats um, and Alibaba as well, and DigitalOcean as well um, from the offset. And then we supported custom hardware if somebody wanted to um, install any of these components on their own infrastructure. Um, so that custom bootloader was written in Rust and Go, a combination of both. Go for the CDK and SDKs for the cloud provider and Rust for the actual runtime. 
Um, and then it was event-based. So rather than things like Terraform, which are configuration-based for deployments, um, this, you could tell it how to react to different events happening within the um, cloud infrastructure or even on the boot to, to be reactive and make additional changes to the infrastructure. We actually added machine learning to this component as well. So it could actually react based on what it had learned um, to do on the uh, to scale infrastructure appropriately. Um, and this is essentially a single click application. So you double click once you've given it the config of what the where the hardware is in terms of the network and it will copy itself onto that what network and build it um, and also secure it. So it will create the firewalls and and lock down the SSH port so no nobody can physically get onto that infrastructure once it's built. Um, and then it just destroys and rebuilds itself over time. Um, so the CDKs and SDKs are already provided by um, the cloud providers. Um, and then it's stateless and reusable. So if you run it again, it will um, just look at things like DNS settings and figure out what the current infrastructure looks like and destroy and rebuild what it needs to each time. Um, so that's for the end users to use in, in terms of the customers, the producers, the farms, or the importers. So actually building the clusters, um, Originally, I did this manually um, and wrote a lot of code. I spent a stupid amount of time writing code over and over again. And then eventually I moved over to using Argo CD for getting the clusters up um, because I could just do the configuration once yeah, using Customize and throwing some Helm configs over and it would build that infrastructure for me. Um, and that would bring it from um, Git, um, Git originally. But that's something I tried to avoid. So I didn't want to drive the infrastructure from Git. I wanted to drive it from the bootloader. So the bootloader would say what infrastructure needs to, to happen, regardless of what's happening in Git. It would just pull it out of Git when it decides it needs to. Um, but uh, essentially, Argo CD, which is what I'm using at this point, is, um, is Git ops driven. Um, and then it separates the configurations from the code. So I could just say, Hey, here's an Argo CD deployment, which is the first thing I did. I, I um, launched two components with this. So I launched a authentication component and then Argo CD. And that was essentially my pipeline up and running. Um, and then once Argo CD is up, it would build the rest of the infrastructure and the code would manage um, how that looks. And then this would could be configuration driven after that. So this only happened um, beginning of last year or the year before, I think 2019, um, I put Argo CD in experimentally, but it's scaling up at the moment. So the cluster architecture now looks like, uh, this is a very simple overview, um, but this is zero trust architecture. So we have an authentication system across the entire environment. And again, you can run your own off layer as long as OAuth 2 and OIDC. Um, there's um, standard um, components that we have Istio for the cloud-based clusters. Um, this cluster's on the edge devices, but I, I won't go into detail on those. They're not that different apart from we're not running Istio on the edge devices due to uh, memory issues originally. And then we have um, uh, Prometheus for logging. Um, and then we have, um, because it's Envoy-based, we use uh, WebAssembly custom extensions to the actual HTTP traffic. So we handle the HTTP and UDP traffic use, using WebAssembly extensions. Um, and then that ports through on each of the service nodes, we push it through to a K-native deployment. So that workload service function component, you can see there, that's essentially a K-native component. And then we used uh, NATS for doing the event queuing. Um, and there's cloud events throughout this architecture as well for how things communicate with each other. This was a sample thing I sent to um, one of the partners we were working with to show them how we did the enterprise integration patterns. Um, so that's why we've got EIB on the middle component there. Um, but it's a fairly generic overview of our uh, K-native cloud deployment for our clusters. They're all essentially the same and they're uh, decentralized and stateless. Um, so we have uh, Tekton now for building services. So Tekton is essentially um, all about the CI. So we only use Argo for the CD and Tekton for the CI. Um, and that begins with the K-native tasks. So we, from the code repository, um, we do the builds once, um, and then we can do multiple deployments from those builds. So we've separated CI and CD completely as two separate ideas. Um, to simplify the, the amount of computation that's happening and reduce the, the amount of potential for errors. Um, using Helm throughout as well with a custom chart museum. Um, and then it, when it gets detected, there's a couple of different um, components that are managing security to, to keep the integrity of the bills um, high. So Notary and Falco are both used to manage the integrity of those images and the dependencies. 
um, and then it goes into container storage. So once the CI pipeline goes into container storage, um, it's fully tested and it's tagged, and we assume at that point that that image is is perfectly usable, um, and we don't have to um, retest it with, um, when we go to a deployment. Um, and then we do uh, there, there's a lot of canary deployments, blue green deployments, and uh, multiple version deployments at the same time that are managed um, in the cluster configs. So multiple versions can be in, in alive at the same time. So we want to make sure that they're still being tested for those dependencies and nothing goes stale. And then cloud events, as I said before, cloud events are used throughout. So cloud events are both used in the custom services, but they're also used in the, the pipeline as well for making sure that when um, something happens within a build or within the infrastructure that we manage the provisioning dynamically based on those cloud events. Um, and then, as I said, this integrity and security checks are part of the automated audit. And then there's a develop gateway. So that was um, simply um, a web-based uh, generation. So using something like, uh, I think it's Hugo for developing a static website from OpenAPI 3 and GraphQL documents, and then generating a documentation and deploying it with Redoc into a cluster environment. And then it uses the same um, zero trust OAuth layer to actually do the authentication after that. So you're still logging in through the same system to, to manage who has access rights to different services to actually develop against those. This is for both third party intern and internal developers. And now for the building models. And so this is where it got a little bit complicated. Originally, we were doing a lot of this manually. So we're using um, a lot of N uh, NVIDIA hardware for doing um, massive model um, development and building and then testing, which didn't really work. We were then doing manual deployment and having to go through Pelion for that as well um, to deploy it to TH devices and mobile devices. And now web applications as well have models built in. Um, so now it's driven by Tekton. So we, I took the same pipelines once I got them working with the service deployment and then got it to continue that build through into Tekton, um, through Tekton into Kuflow. So Tekton throws um, the process for building a model into Kuflow. We use uh, feast feature extraction and KTIB for um, hyperparameter tuning. Use TensorFlow um, data validation to validate the data, then use um, TensorFlow for model training predominantly. Um, there's a couple of other um, uh, data science tools that we're using, but mostly it's TensorFlow. I've been using TensorFlow for quite a, quite a few years now, so it's uh, it works well at this scale. And then we use TensorFlow model analysis to do the analysis of the model and make sure it's performing. So there's, in fact, in the uh, ETL and in the models, uh, model training, there's a lot of unit testing um, throughout. So that this isn't typical in the industry when you're doing data science projects, but it is something I've ensured that goes throughout this. So there's unit testing and model testing throughout to make sure that the integrity of the models are, are correct. Um, and there's federation on these models as well. So this isn't a centralized machine learning system. This is a federated one where we deploy the models to the edge and even mobile devices and they run there. They don't run in a central cloud environment that often. And then they federate their intelligence together dynamically. So they have to be tested rigorously to make sure that the results will be usable. And then they're deployed using um, TensorFlow serving on Knative as well. So TensorFlow serving is running on a Knative deployment and then the models are deployed there um, with an API. And then they can be pulled down there or they can be pulled down physically using TensorFlow Lite um, onto devices dynamically. So we can update mobile apps without replacing the app itself just by pulling down the model. And we do that with the um, edge deployment as well. So the edge deployment, again, Pelion device management and Yocto, but when we're rolling out things, we're doing it with phased edge de developments. So we can schedule what's happening. For example, if we pick Kenya as a region, we can say Kenya is getting an update next week, but the rest of the world's not going to get it for another month. And then it allows us to manage those rollouts a bit more effectively. Again, we use this process for um, rolling out deployments in um, medical projects and the forestry solutions as well to make sure that we don't roll out everything at once and we can test different regions and we also can do rollbacks. Um, so we can do region and cust customer in this case. Um, there wasn't really a customer, um, but there is a customer in the medical solutions and the forestry solutions. So we had to be able to tag those separately as well and give them a specific version in the pipeline rollouts. And then we do um, increment versions with Canary and Semver 2 deployments, and we use those in the headers. So the, a lot of people will specifically set versions, for example, in the URLs for services. 
uh, we use HTTP headers, so that's how I determine which version we should be um, we should be directing traffic to on the actual clusters. And then the micro devices download the TF light models, and again the federators. So when the TF light models are on the devices, then the the models learn on those devices and send their learnings, not data, back to the cloud. So it's entirely privacy aware. We were not actually sharing data from any organization. We just sharing the learnings and then the models are improved at that point and, and thrown back down. Um, so this solution entirely from end to end is now uh, we have a cluster set up on day one um, with Argo CD. Um, and then we have uh, Tekton doing the uh, CI builds throughout. Um, and then that drives the, the versioning system. And then everything is K-native, including on the edge, the K3S deployment on the edge device is, is a K-native deployment as well. Um, uh, as, uh, as, 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 as you. Yep. You, you have about three to five more minutes. I, I'm, I'm done. That's, uh, thank you.